Social distancing is stressful and it's starting to get to you. Ignoring CDC guidelines, you call a friend and arrange to meet for lunch. You're just in time for lunch. With pleasure. You choose a place with outdoor seating which feels safer. You take all the precautions, you wear gloves, and you try not to touch your face. Secretly, you think this whole thing might be overblown. But what you don't know is that 10 days ago, the friend you're about to meet contracted the novel coronavirus. Viruses have been multiplying inside his body ever since. This is the story of a coronavirus infection. At lunch, the passage of your friend's breath over the lining of his upper throat creates tiny droplets of virus-laden mucus that waft into the air. Some settle onto the food on your plate, some drift onto your fingers, others are drawn into your nasal passage or settle in your throat. At this point, your body is carrying 43,654 virus particles, and by the time you've said your goodbyes, that number is up to 312,405. Inside your body, the virus makes its way to the branching passages of your lungs, settling into the mucus coating the tissue. Each particle is round and very small. The outer membrane of the virus has an oily layer embedded with jagged protein molecules called spike proteins. In the middle of the virus particle is a coiled strand of RNA, the virus's genetic material. As the virus drifts through the lung's mucus, it bumps into one of the cells that line the surface. A billion years of evolution have equipped this cell to resist attackers, but it also has a vulnerability, a chunk of protein called an ACE2 receptor. Normally, this molecule plays a role in modulating hormone activity, but today it becomes an anchor for the coronavirus. For the sake of example and to better understand what happens next, consider the life cycle of one of the better known types of viruses, the phage. In a way, a virus is a parasite. It attacks a host cell and takes over its chemical machinery for making proteins and nucleic acids. The phage begins by attaching to the wall of a bacteria cell. Next, it breaks down the wall and injects viral nucleic acid into the cell. The acid uses the cell's enzymes and organelles to replicate new viral parts that become new virus particles. Finally, the phage releases an enzyme that begins to break down the cell's wall, and just like that, the virus has multiplied. All up and down your lungs, throat, and mouth, the scene is repeated over and over as cell after cell is attacked and hijacked. As fragments of disintegrated cells spread through your bloodstream, your immune system finally senses that something is wrong. White blood cells detect the fragments of dead cells and release chemicals called cytokines that serve as an alarm signal, activating other parts of the immune system. When responding immune cells identify a cell that has become infected, they attack and destroy it. Meanwhile, the body's temperature rises and the infected area becomes inflamed. Two days later, you begin to feel nauseated. You lie down and sleep for a few hours, but when you wake up, you realize that you've only gotten worse. Your chest feels tight and you've got a dry cough. You wonder, is this what it feels like? You take your temperature and read the result, 102. It might just be regular flu, you think, and even if it is the virus, you're young-ish and otherwise healthy. You're not in the high-risk group. You're right, of course, in a sense. But for reasons scientists don't quite understand, about 20% of people who contract the coronavirus become severely ill. For that 20%, the story could end with isolation in intensive care, on top of the more common raging fever, body aches, a dry cough that makes it harder and harder to breathe. It could, in serious cases, lead to a kind of intense and dangerous pneumonia called acute respiratory distress syndrome. That could lead to you being put on a ventilator that would, hopefully, save your life. But. Most people who become infected with the coronavirus won't make it as far as the ICU. Over the course of the epidemic, the CDC has estimated that between 160 million and 214 million people in the United States could become infected. Yet for the majority of those who do fall ill, 
with bed rest, they get better. Remember, a virus is just a parasite. And like any parasite, it must be passed from host to host. Stop the transmission, and you stop the virus. Although viruses have always been a part of our world, we have still managed to survive. One step at a time, we have learned about viral disease. And one step at a time, we are learning how to stop it.